Tear down time. This is a scientific calculator. It costs me uh, all of five dollars. I want to see uh, what the integrated circuit looks like. Uh, so obviously the back's off, and you can see an LCD and a couple battery holders. Uh, if you flip the LCD panel, uh, you can then see this round black blob uh, that uh, integrated circuit hiding under there. It's known as uh, chip on board. Uh, let's uh, take a pair of shears and cut it from the circuit board. That's the, the fastest way to extract these, uh, and drop it into an acid bath to uh, strip off the epoxy and fiberglass. And that, of course, will give us uh, a picture of the uh, silicon dye that was hiding under there, and uh, here we have it. Now, of course, the question is, what are we looking at? Um, and to sort that down, uh, let's go take some uh, look at references we can find on the web. In the last uh, teardown, I talked about using the U.S. patent system as a great wealth of information. Uh, this time, let's take a look at something different. Uh, that's the magazines produced by large corporations. Uh, now, if you're familiar with the history of the scientific calculator, the first one was produced by uh, Hewlett-Packard uh, in the handheld formats. And uh, they had a really good journal called the HP Journal. It covered some... Uh, I covered everything they produced, quite frankly, uh, in great detail. They'd often produced a really wonderful technical article. Uh, and no difference here for the scientific calculator. In 1972, uh, they published their uh, seminal article. Uh, you can uh, Google this. I'll put the link in uh, the description of the video if you just want to click on it. Uh, it's a definitely a good read. Um, in the articles, there's the block diagram, which is very helpful. Um, now, this article is uh, se uh, 44 years old, but actually it's quite relevant still to uh, what we're looking at today. Because uh, that diagram there actually seems to have a lot of uh, commonality to the actual integrated circuit we're seeing here. Uh, let's see. Uh, first up, uh, there's a ROM section. Not a huge surprise. Uh, there's some sort of storage you would need for a calculator. And uh, let's uh, take a look at on the die. and We'll see that there's two sections on the lower portion that look like ROMs. And uh, let's just zoom into one of them. And uh, those little shiny bits, I believe, are fuses. And what ha essentially happens is the ROM... Uh, is laid out in polysilicon and then the fuses determine whether or not the bits one or zero. Uh, it's a good design approach because you get this late binding uh, decision. Uh, metal's the very last layer you put on a semiconductor, so if you had any last minute changes you could uh, do that. Um, now of course there's two sections. Uh, one I'm going to presume is probably a lookup table for the trigonometric functions and the other is probably for the sequencer. Uh, let's go to the trig section first. Um, now, one challenge of a scientific calculator was to calculate uh, the trig functions, uh, sine, cosine, and tangent quickly. Uh, you can do it with a Taylor series, it would take far too long. Uh, and there's actually an algorithm out there called Cordic, and uh, let's pop up the wiki reference here. Um, and I'm also going to pop up a, a reference to a good web paper on Cordic. Um, it was definitely used in the HP calculator, and I'm going to presume probably in this calculator too, because it's a, a very efficient way of calculating trig functions only using shifts, adds, um, and some very simple lookup. So, and that would explain uh, one section of the ROM, and it would also be about appropriate for the size of the ROM. We're not looking at a lot of bits there. Uh, next stop, uh, control and timing circuit. Uh, you can obviously implement a calculator using a general purpose microprocessor, but uh, that doesn't look like it's been done here because there's just not enough gates sitting there. Uh, and back in 1972, of course, that wasn't even possible to create such a complicated function yet. Uh, because uh, integration hadn't reached that point. Uh, what we're looking at basically is a state machine. Uh, and uh, the most likely uh, place for the state machine here is all these rows of gates sitting in the middle of the chip. Uh, let's just zoom in a little bit and uh, take a look uh, at them. There's basically four rows and uh, then there's a lot of metallized interconnects between them. And uh, what we have here is polysilicon below, then all of this wire on top which confuses the picture a little bit. Uh, let's strip the chip, take the metal off the top and take a look at just the uh, polysilicon below that. Uh, and get sort of ghostly white uh, picture. And let me just zoom right into uh, one of the bands and uh, we can start to see the uh, basics of the transistors which actually uh, uh, are part of the integrated circuit. So really interesting here, right, right at the very lowest level of an integrated circuit. Uh, obviously uh, silicon uh, dyes are produced on a large wafer and there's always the bulk uh, bottom of the wafer and it's called bulk silicon. Uh, it's either doped N or P. This is undoubtedly a CMOS process uh, given that it's battery powered. And then uh, you can see all those uh, little funny rectangles. Those are uh, areas which have been doped either N or P. Uh, sometimes they, they scoop inwards. That's not a visual um, illusion. That's true. Um, all sorts of cool 3D things going on in semiconductors. Uh, what would happen in those areas which are scooped downwards, they would have been filled with probably silicon dioxide and then polished off. And what's also just extremely interesting is the little tiny round pillars. Uh, those undoubtedly are items where the silicon's reaching upwards to reach to a metallization layer. So you can, of course, connect all the various bits together. 
So there we go. We're actually looking at uh, the very finest details in this integrated circuit. And one great thing about some of these older process nodes, you don't need a really sophisticated microscope uh, to see the, uh, the tremendous details that we're seeing here. Zooming back out, uh, if you look at the kind of count of the number of gates you're looking at, there's around 300 to 400 gates sitting there. So for the confirmation that this chip is really probably quite close to what Hewlett and Packard had back in 72 uh, with the timing and control circuit, Let's um, pop up to the middle section of the chip. We can see uh, all those black uh, rectangles. Uh, that's the register store almost undoubtedly. There's looks like there's four of them. Um, you gotta remember each digit you see in the calculator has to be coded uh, BCD almost certainly, four bits per digit. Um, and then of course this calculator has what's known as co a constant or continuous memory. If you turn it off, it retains its state. So it explains why we're looking at such a large size. I think we're looking at very large transistors. Uh, which have very low leakage characteristics. Uh, why we see four, of course, there's one for the display. Uh, this is a scientific calculator. It can do complex numbers, so that could explain another register. Uh, we can also do stats, so that probably explains another register. You need about three to do a standard deviation. And the fourth one, uh, it has a constant memory too, I believe. So uh, you can easily explain why you're seeing uh, four different registers there. Okay, let's, uh, let's flip between the whole chip and the chip with uh, the metalization on. You can see the area where all the pads are in the perimeter of the chip. And as we flip between the two, you can see how much area in the silicon is taken by those uh, pads. And if we zoom next to each pad, you can see a, a very regular structure. That's basically the I.O. buffer. Uh, this is uh, on the left-hand side of the chip. It's, I believe, the keyword going into it. So these are probably input-only uh, I.O.s. So. Uh, other things you can see, there's a capacitors there with the white rectangles. Uh, the items to the uh, right of it, I'm tempted to say that's the uh, ALU, uh, but I must admit I'm not entirely sure. There's always a bit of mystery when you're doing these. It's, uh, it's like a fantastic puzzle to sort down. Um, anyways, uh, there's all the little things you can see just from a, a scientific calculator. Uh, tremendously interesting uh, device and uh, doesn't look too much unchanged, quite frankly, from uh, something that you would see perhaps in the late 80s. Uh, really consistent, uh, if you haven't seen my four function video, same thing. I guess technology just reaches a certain point and becomes very mature and uh, they just keep on cranking them out. All right, that's what I saw from my uh, teardown of a $5 scientific calculator.